Good morning. How are we doing this morning? We're glad that you're here. And uh, we're going to be in John chapter 5 this morning. If you have a Bible, John chapter 5. Um, hey, I thought as the lead pastor of Redemption Church, I could pull an audible this afternoon. Maybe around 6.30 we could have a prayer meeting. <laughs> that, would that be good for anybody here? Okay. Well, I know where we're at, right? So we are, we're glad that you are here, whether in person or joining us uh, online this morning. Um, today we're going to look at a text that we haven't looked at since uh, the summer of 2015. And um, so if you're with us in the beginning, uh, as a part of our core team when we launched Redemption, uh, you'll remember looking at this text. But I want us to start out uh, by reading a book. And it's a kid's book, and it's one of my all-time favorite kid's books, and it's called Good News, Bad News. And so we'll have the pictures for you on the screen. Is it okay that I read a book to you this morning? Is that all right? Okay. All right. So good news, bad news. All right. So here's the first page. It's good news, and it's a rabbit bringing a picnic to his friend who's a mouse. Bad news, it's raining. Good news, the rabbit brought a full-size umbrella in his picnic basket. Bad news, it's super windy. Good news, they found coverage under the tree. Bad news, apples are falling from the tree. Good news, hey, we can eat apples. That's my interpretation. <laughs> Bad news, but there's a worm that smiles at you in the apple. But good news, I have the worst looking cake of all time unwrapped inside my picnic basket. <laughs> Bad news, there's bees with teeth on the cake. <laughs> good news, I also brought a fly swatter with me in my picnic basket. Bad news, made a mess. But good news, we can still eat the frosting. Bad news, here comes all the bees with their angry teeth. Good news, there's a cave nearby. Bad news, there's a bear in the cave. Good news, there's a random metal flagpole in the middle of nowhere. Bad news, lightning struck the pole. Good news, the bear's gone now. We look a little toasty. Bad, 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 bad news, the mouse screams. Bad news, the rabbit is sad. But the light is breaking through. And the mouse goes on a run. And the good news is he brings the picnic basket back to his, to his friend. Very good news. Great book, right? I'll say I might copy for 20 bucks right, after the service. Good news, bad news. Question, how desperate are you for some good news? How desperate for you... How desperate are you for some good news? I, I think oftentimes uh, our desire for good news is often related to circumstances that we faced in life. This desperation builds, I think, for good news when we experience something in life to where we can't control the outcome, and that creates in us this desire and this hunger for good news. I remember when my wife was battling cancer for seven years where the cancer came back four different times. Every time there was a PET scan scheduled, we're waiting for the result and inside us was this terrible anxiety, right, that, that built really high as, as if nothing else mattered in our lives. We simply wanted good news. Maybe you've experienced that kind of desperation before. Maybe for you, it's different, though. You may be replying to the university, your number one choice, and you're waiting to hear if you get in. Maybe for you, you had a job interview this week, and you, just, you really need God to come through. You need the good news of having the security of that job. We all know what it's like to have this desperation for good news. Has everyone ever told you before, hey, I have some good news and bad news? What's typically the follow-up question? What do you want first, right? 
I don't know about you. Here's what I always say. I always say I want, I want the bad news first, right? Let's end with what's good. Let's start with what's bad. And so that's what we're going to do this morning in, in John chapter 5 as we wrestle with how desperate are you for some good news. Now, now here's the truth this morning. Um, most pastors won't often confess this, but there's times when you plan all week for how you think this thing should go, this message should go. And I'm coming in here today saying I'm kind of confused on what God wants to do this morning. And so I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray for me uh, because I need the Holy Spirit uh, to give me some clarity this morning. All right, so let's pray together and we'll jump in to John chapter 5. Jesus, I want to thank you for your word. And I want to thank you for Redemption Church and the chance that we have to gather together to, to worship you and bring glory to your name. Lord, we exist for you. And Lord, I want to pray that uh, people experience life change this morning. And as we think through um, the fourth sola of Christ alone, I just want to pray, Lord, that we will leave here with a greater understanding this morning of what that means in your name. Amen. How desperate are you for some good news? Here, here, here is the bad news. We have an exclusive insufficiency for life. The story in John chapter 5 starts out, and it's going to build with some crazy tension between the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the religious elite, and Jesus. And what's happening is the religious leaders and the Pharisees are, are so appalled and offended by Jesus that he would dare heal someone on the Sabbath. Because when he heals someone on the Sabbath, he breaks Sabbath law, they believe. And if you study the Old Testament, you learn this, that when you break the Sabbath law, it's punishable by death. And so the story starts out in the first few verses of John 5. We're going to be skimming through this whole chapter this morning. But the story starts out with Jesus coming into Jerusalem, and he goes over by the sheep gate, and at the sheep gate is a pool. And this pool is surrounded by five colonnades. And if you go to Israel today, you can go visit the remains of this pool. It's actually quite impressive to actually see. But surrounding the pool is people that were blind and lame and paralyzed. And in the story, there's this invalid who's been sitting there. He's 38 years old. He's never walked in his entire life. He's waiting around the pool for someone to help him get into the pool. Now, here's what's interesting. I just summarized the first few verses of John 5. I want you to go look at verse 4 on your own. Do you see it? Any volunteers to read it? Verse 4 doesn't exist, right? The text goes from verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, right to verse 5. I can count. Can you count? <laughs> Is this mislabeled? Like, well, what's actually happening here? And here's the truth. Our earliest Greek manuscripts do not have verse 4 as a part of the inerrant scriptures. What was that verse? The verse was about this, that this angel of the Lord would appear at this pool and the angel would stir the water up and by stirring the water up, the first person who got in the water would actually be healed, was the belief. Now, that's a very unique thing. It's not part of the original scriptures. So we can't count it as God's word. But that doesn't mean that people didn't have the belief that that was reality. In fact, we'll read here, starting in, uh, verse, in verse 5, we'll see that that actually was a belief by those who were gathered around the pool as to why they were actually there. Look at verse 5 with me. It says, One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said, Do you want to be healed and the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed, and he walked. And so think about what this man believes. Why are they there? He's there because if he believes when the water stirred up, if he gets in the pool, he's going to be healed. But what does Jesus do? Jesus knew this man's been here a long time. Jesus knows everything, by the way. He knows everyone's story. And Jesus looks at him and says, hey, do you want to be healed today? 
Like, like, do you want some good news today? Would you enjoy that? Put yourself in the man's shoes. You haven't walked for 38 years of your whole life. Uh, my response would be, what do you think I'm doing here? Right? I'm here because there's a belief that, that we can find healing right here in this pool. I'm here for healing. To me, though, it's as if Jesus isn't really here to play games. Like, hey, man, I'm not going to push you in the pool. I'm not going to swim with you. Today's not the day you and I are playing Marco Polo. Right? That's not what's happening in the story. What, what does Jesus actually say? Here's what Jesus is, is revealing. Jesus is not dependent upon the water to heal this man. He can do it within himself. He is God in the flesh. And Jesus looks at the man and he says, get up, take your mat, and walk. Now for you and I, that doesn't move our hearts. This man has never walked for 38 years. And he had to respond to what Jesus just said. Am I going to listen to this crazy man walk? I don't know how to do that. And in that moment, parts of his body that have never worked before began to work. Parts that had no strength began to have strength as this man stands up and he starts to walk. And in that moment, his position in life just changed. Like, think about it. He was an outcast in society. Now he could go get a job. He could provide for his family. He could provide for himself. He could do things he's never been able to do before. His future is brighter because he met Jesus. And here's what Jesus is saying. You don't need the pool to be healed. You only need me. I referenced earlier my wife's battle with cancer uh, one time. Uh, we were encouraged to go to this, I don't know if this place exists anymore, but it was called the prayer room in Grand Rapids. I had no idea what we were walking into until I got there and we realized it was a name and claim it place. If you don't know what I mean, sorry. If you do, you know what I mean. And you have an hour appointment and these people are there uh, to pray for you. They put their hands on you. And they pray for you. And we're never going to say no to anyone praying for us. But here's what happened. They taught my wife for 57 minutes about how weak her faith is. And they then prayed for her for three minutes of the hour. And after that, the woman stood right up out of her chair and goes, you're healed. We're looking at her like. And then she immediately gave a disclaimer sheet to Steph and said, if your cancer comes back, it's because you didn't have faith. That's when I put the folding chair and I beat the woman. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. That's what was happening inside me. The disclaimer sheet. So if you are still sick, it's not Jesus' fault, it's your fault. Isn't that crazy? Is that what happened when Jesus healed this man? Like when I study the scriptures, I don't know how people even get that. <laughs> Literally, Jesus says, get up and walk. Oh, by the way, here's your disclaimer sheet. Was this a fake healing in John 5? Was this a faith healing in John 5? No. God, Jesus, graciously intervened, and it was a gracious, full healing for this Man, Jesus has intervened. There was no money exchanged. There was no contract signed. There was no disclaimer given. Jesus intervened. It's as if this guy existed for this very moment. You go to John chapter 9 in your own time. I wasn't planning on sharing this, but based on the name and claim it kind of stuff. John chapter 9, there's this guy that needed Jesus to heal him. And Jesus heals this guy. And the disciples say, is this, does this guy uh, have these issues because of his sins or his parents' sins? And Jesus says, nah, he's like this for this very moment that I may heal him and my glory may be revealed. It actually had nothing to do with the man at all. 
Everything to do with that moment in history of Jesus wanting to do something crazy. So back to John 5 and the story, the problem is Jesus just healed this guy on the Sabbath. And he's going to have this conversation with the Pharisees. And in verse 17, I want you to see it. But Jesus answered them. He says, my father is working until now and I am working. Remember the Sabbath. Don't heal on the Sabbath. Don't break the Sabbath law. Here's what Jesus is saying. I don't need a Sabbath. God doesn't have to take a day off. The Sabbath is not for God. God has authority over it. God is the one who actually created it. So literally, they're upset because Jesus carried out an act of mercy. In fact, look at the verses in verse 10. The the Pharisees interact with the healed man. Check this out in verse 10. It says, So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. (laughs) Wait, what? What are you talking about? What what is their response? Are they excited that this man was just healed? He hasn't walked at all, never in his life, and for the first time in his life, he's actually walking? No, what do they do? They, They crash his good news party with some bad news, and the Pharisees say, hey man, sorry bro, but you really can't be carrying your bed on the Sabbath. That fits under the category of work. Did you know that with all the rules that the Pharisees added to the law, that if you carry someone on a mat, it's not breaking the law, but if you carry the mat with no person on it, it's breaking the law? It's just nonsense, right? It's nonsense. So here's what they're saying. Because you broke the law carrying your mat, you deserve to die. You deserve death is what they're ultimately saying. What would you say if you're that man? I want no part of your religion, is what I would say. I haven't walked for 38 years. I've never experienced this in this moment. And right here, you're upset that I'm carrying my mat? You can't acknowledge the good that's actually happened? Yes, sorry, man. I understand you're pumped that you're healed, but man, when you, when you gain that healing in a sinful way, it's just really not, really not good. Kind of make the observation that the bad news of who these religious leaders are, is actually starting to actually be revealed in this moment. Literally is exclusion at all costs. This guy just experienced physical life change and they have no heart for it. And they don't realize that this exclusive life that they think is so awesome is actually insufficient and actually leaves them heartless. All they want to do is walk on and be the police for everybody. Making sure that everybody actually obeys the rules. They do not have a heart for this man at all. The question I have when I read John 5 is, is how do these guys have any friends? Would you have that same question? Can we just make the observation that sometimes someone is more important than the rules? And to be honest, they're bothered that this man is healed. They're bothered that he's carrying his mat. But more importantly, they're bothered by the man who actually healed this guy. If we saw someone come in here and heal someone who's never walked in their whole life, that would be pretty impressive, wouldn't it? I will tell that person to take it. Take that news. Right? Accept that. But look at verse 18. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, speaking of Jesus. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus is saying, I am God. He's going to go on to share four different witnesses in his conversation about him being God that he has with the Pharisees. All right, the first is this. He's going to say, God the Father is a witness. He's going to say, John the Baptist is a witness, which we'll talk about briefly. He's going to say that my miracles and healings are a witness. He's going to, and he's going to say that the scriptures are a witness themselves. So look at verse 38. We're jumping way down now. He says this, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. Verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do, not, I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. Here's the crazy part. The Pharisees have no concept, no concept of the bad news. That they, they exclusively have this insufficiency for life. They have no concept. They're blind to their own spiritual state. 
And if that's true, the good news of a person from Jesus would never sound so good until you realize you need the very news that he's offering. And that is true for you and I as well. So think about this. What Jesus is about to do is he's about to reveal the bad news, but then he wants to rescue with good news. But you can never see the good news if you never see your insufficiency. This is where you and I are often like the Pharisees in this very moment. As Jesus looks at them and he says this, you do not have the Father's word abiding in you. Now remember, these are religious elite. They like have the Old Testament memorized. Like they study the Bible more than us. They pray more than us. And Jesus looked at them and says, you do not have the word in you. And I can just see the Pharisees saying, man, that makes no sense. You know who we are, right? We're the religious leaders. You know that people come to us for spiritual advice? You know that people seek us out for, for advice? And why do they come to us? Because we know the word. And Jesus says this, you do not know the word. And the reason you do not know the word is because you do not know me. And then verse 42. Look at it again. But I know that you do not have the love of God within you. Let me rephrase that verse. Jesus says, but I know you. That would be one of the most scary statements or one of the most encouraging statements you could ever hear out of the mouth of Jesus. I know you. He looks at every religious leader in the face. I know you, and I know you, and I know you, and I know you. I know every part of who you are. And so what does Jesus want these religious leaders to actually know? What does he want them to actually see? He says this, you do not have the love of God within you. Everything you do is absent of God. Everything you do is absent of God. Everything you do is absent of God. Everything you do is absent of God, is what he's saying. What does Jesus know about you? What do you wish Jesus didn't know about you? We probably could all come up with a list. Here's what he's saying. Jesus is saying, just because I know you doesn't mean that you know me. Are you desperate for some good news? We can see the insufficiency in the Pharisees. It's exclusive to the human race. Do you see it within yourself? Let's get to the good news, because I like good news a lot better than bad news. Anybody else? Here's the good news, that only Jesus has the exclusive capability to rescue. Look back at verse 39. Again, this is the key verse of the whole text. He says this, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Think about what's happened up to this point in the story. Jesus has revealed that he's in charge. Jesus has revealed that, that he has authority over the sick, over the lame, over the blind. He has authority over the Sabbath. He has authority over sickness. He's claimed to have uh, to be equal with God. Question, are you good with that? Are you good with what Jesus says about himself? Because if that's true, Jesus' opinions will trump your opinions. If that's true, what Jesus thinks matters more than what we actually think. If Jesus looks at you and he calls your sin, sin, are you good with that? If Jesus looks at you and says, you need to surrender to me, are you good with that? Here's the challenge, church. What we see in the religious leaders, we see in ourselves. And that is this. From the moment sin entered the world in Genesis chapter 3, me, you, we, every human of all time, has pushed against authority. We've rebelled against authority. Can we just be honest? We don't like authority. We don't want to be told what to do. 
And here's the greatest challenge in the text that the Pharisees have to wrestle with, and it's the very thing that you have to wrestle with, and that is this. Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? That he's Lord. Notice I didn't say, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Do you believe that Jesus is God? Do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Do you believe that Jesus is creator? I, I didn't ask you that. Do you believe that Jesus can heal? Do you believe that Jesus is gracious? Do you believe that Jesus is patient? Do you believe that Jesus is forgiving? I didn't ask you that. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross? Do you believe that Jesus rose again? Do you believe that Jesus ascended back to heaven? Do you believe that Jesus currently sits on the throne reigning over all things? I didn't ask you that. We love, let's be honest, we love what God can give us. We just don't love him. Give us grace. Give us patience. Give us forgiveness. That's great. Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? You see, here's the challenge for you and I, is that to understand God's love, we have to experience God's love. And to experience God's love, you have to face the reality that a holy God died in your place. And the good news of the gospel, it loses its power if it's not based on Christ alone, which we've talked about last week with grace alone, and the previous week with faith alone, and he encompasses all the scriptures, right, in the scriptures alone, the, the word of God alone. In other words, if we remove Christ from the gospel, the gospel ceases to be good. Everything is about him. Look back at verse 32 with me, jumping back. We're going to see Jesus speak to the religious leaders about the witness of, of John the Baptist. He says, there is another, in verse 32, who bears witness about me. And I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has bore witness to the truth. Not that the testimony I received is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light, he says. If you don't agree with who Jesus says he is, there's going to be tension. Here's what that means. I don't care that we were raised in West Michigan for most of us in the room. I don't care that you were born and your parents spanked Jesus into you, you think. I don't care that you were baptized as a baby. I don't care the spiritual decisions that your parents made. It doesn't have any eternal weight for you unless you know him. And there's so many in our city walking around just like the Pharisees thinking they have it all figured out. They have the Bible memorized. They were spanked with it when they were kids. They have it all dialed in. But we're not actually saved. And the truth is many here, I think, are in the same spiritual position as the religious leaders. And what I mean by that is this. You've done really good things, but Jesus will look at you and say, I don't know you. Check out what Jesus said about John the Baptist. Remember what we just read? Here's what Jesus said. He said, you loved the message of John the Baptist for a while. Do you see how he described John the Baptist in verse 35? Look at it again. He described John as a burning and shining lamp. What's the purpose of a lamp? A lamp gives direction and it gives guidance. A lamp is never the end game in and of itself. I've never been to anyone's home from Redemption Church, walked in the living room and said, oh man, look at that lamp. I've never met one person who has their lamp be in the middle of the room, that everything evolves around the wonder and the beauty of the lamp. I've never enjoyed buying a lamp. I've never dreamed about wanting to own a lamp. What do lamps do? Lamps create light. They illuminate so we can see what's actually true. And so here's the visual picture. Jesus is saying John the Baptist was this lamp. 
He was giving off light. You were under the lamp for a while hearing the truth, and then you stepped outside of the lamp, and you're literally just sitting in darkness, Jesus is saying. Then he said this, you were willing to rejoice in its light for a while, but at some point you stopped. The joy that you had from the message that John was sharing It was no longer joyful for you. And so what changed? You see, you aligned with John's understanding of the scriptures until John identified me as the Messiah, he's saying. So they're under the lamp, eating everything John is saying, loving it. And then all of a sudden, John said, here comes the lamb, the Messiah. And they're like... It's the same way that you and I will step out from its light. When we realize that Jesus declares that he is God, that he's actually Lord, because for for the Pharisees, this Jesus didn't fit their vision of what the Messiah would be. They've been waiting for the Messiah to come. They know what the scriptures actually say. They need the Messiah to come, but they don't like Jesus as the Messiah. He doesn't fit the image of what they thought would actually happen. You see, they wanted a Messiah to come on a white horse, run into Rome with a sword, destroy the throne so they get rid of all the oppression of God's people and so they can be free of the oppression from Rome. Instead, Jesus didn't go into Rome and overturn it. What did he do? He went into the temple, his own house, and he flipped over the tables. And he called them all hypocrites. Church, our culture isn't any different can we just make the observation that like everyone are in, in, I feel like in the United States of America, it seems <coughs> that most are really cool and fine when people talk about a higher being. Everyone seems fine. You talk about the big guy upstairs. Many people are fine when you just even talk about God. But the moment you mention the name of Jesus, people are offended. This is also true in the churches in our own city. One of our elders, Matt Thompson, uh, he oversees all church planning in the state of Michigan in our network. And him and I have worked together. He's one of our founding pastors and an elder here. And and, uh, we've worked together over the last many years to train many church planters around our state. It's a seven-month commitment for these planters. We train them. We send them. We get to send some out. We get to encourage them in any way that we can as a church. And so we've trained over 20 church planners here at Redemption Church. And one thing we tell them every single time we can is they're trying to figure out why their church is going to exist. What's the DNA going to be? And I'm like, the Spirit will lead you to what you want that to be. But let me give you, with some great conviction, tell you that you need to be about the name of Jesus. Explicitly be about and passionately about the name of Jesus. And I'm grateful at Redemption Church that we don't get everything right. Like, there's tons of ways that we can grow and get better as a church. I fully recognize that. But I can hang my hat on the hook at night saying, I'm so grateful for the very beginning. We've been elevating the name of Jesus. We're not ashamed of him. We want to be passionate about him. In fact, that is why this church was called Redemption Church eight years ago. It's not called the first church of Granville, the 23rd church of Granville. It's called Redemption Church. Why? Because we believe that our city needs a church that's solely focused on the person and the work of Jesus. And the name Redemption Church was chosen simply because we believe that Jesus changes everything. And you can hear that message, church, wherever you sit right now, whatever baggage you came in with this morning, it can be hard at home with your kids. Your marriage might be in a bad spot. Work might be falling apart. I just want you to hear me. Jesus changes everything. Not some things, he changes all things. And so Jesus says in verse 39, I want you to see it again, that you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness about me, yet you've refused to come to me that you may have life. What is Jesus saying when he says, you search the scriptures? Meaning, the religious elite, they understand the Bible. What does Jesus mean when he talks about you search the scriptures? Listen, he's referencing only the Old Testament. Let me quickly highlight two major themes in the Old Testament for you to understand. 
I'll give you a bad news one and a good news one. Here's the bad news, the first theme of the Old Testament. That man is hopelessly rebellious and, and, and unable to save themselves. Think about that. That's what we've been talking about all morning. You see, when I read the Bible, here's what we see. We see terrible sinners. We literally just went through almost 18 months going through 50 chapters of the book of Genesis together. We could talk about Noah. Sure. What did Noah do after the flood? Got naked and got wasted. We could talk about Abraham. I'm good. We talked a lot about him. We could talk about Isaac. We could talk about Jacob. All of them, every one of them is an absolute mess. We could go to Exodus and talk about Moses, the guy who led Israel out of slavery from Egypt. He was a mess. We could talk about David. He's described in the Bible as a man after God's own heart, yet he's committed murder and adultery. Every single character seems to be a mess. You can go read Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament that tells the story of all these people in the Old Testament. And often what happens is we call them the great people of faith. And we look at their story though, and it's a mess. Every person was rebellious. Why does the Bible display all their dirty laundry? Here's the answer. So that you and I can clearly see that every person is a rebellious sinner in desperate need of an incredible rescuer. Here's the second theme of the Old Testament. Good news, that God promised to send a rescuer to save man. Go read Hebrews chapter 11 again. We can learn and go back and look at their stories of all the sinfulness of every man and woman that's actually listed there. But here's what's crazy. God was gracious and God intervened and God worked in that moment. And so here's what's true. From the moment sin entered the world, God made a promise that he would send a rescuer to save. And so Jesus himself, talking to the Pharisees who know the Old Testament inside and out, Jesus is like, man, I'm all over that Old Testament. I mean, think about the names we could talk about. Jesus is seen in the Old Testament as the promised seed. He's the Lion of Judah. He's the Son of Man. He's a suffering servant in Isaiah 53. He's the Passover Lamb in Exodus 12. He's the Messiah. Here's what Jesus is saying. The entire Old Testament, every aspect of it and every part of it, bears witness to me. And so when you miss out on Jesus, you're going to miss out on grace, mercy, forgiveness, reconciliation, and so here's one of the points we need to make this morning is that the Bible's not about you. It's always and only about him. You see, what Jesus is communicating is spiritually dangerous because here's what he's telling the religious leaders and here's what he's telling all of us in West Michigan that you can cling to the scriptures and not know me. It's possible. You can read the Bible every day and you can miss out on the hero. You can miss out on the one that it's actually speaking about. You can have a really high view of the Bible and actually gain nothing. Yet from Genesis to Revelation, it's elevating the name of one. Jesus is the hero. And that good news of Christ affects every single part of the message. And so we can randomly turn to any verse in the Bible and here's what it's saying. Listen, if that verse doesn't talk about Jesus and isn't connected to Christ, that paragraph will be. And if that paragraph's not connected to Christ, that chapter will be. And if that chapter's not connected to Christ, that book certainly will be. Because all 66 books of the Bible, all woven together perfectly, right, to talk about God's gracious plan to usher in good news to rescue rebellious sinners. Jesus gets all the glory. All 66 books elevate the glory of one. So what does that mean? That means that Redemption Church, we kind of have like what we call an invisible spiritual flagpole. And we get to put one flag on that pole. One. And that means every time that we gather at Redemption Church, all week our team is praying, working through worship and, and Bible, Bible reading that we do together, even, on, even multiple times this morning, reading the Bible in our worship. 
times we have dedicated time to pray and we worship and we open up the word and the flag that we're putting on the flagpole every single week is Jesus alone, Christ alone. Do you know that there are like 230 denominations in the world and every denomination is going to raise a different flag on their flagpole? And maybe you've actually seen this before. Some are going to elevate what? They're going to elevate tradition. This is how we've always done this. Others are going to elevate preference. Some will elevate worship style. Others will elevate performance or legalism. I know a church that elevates end times. That's their thing. What about this one? Politics. Are you uncomfortable yet? You know it's coming, right, in November? There's an election that's going to happen. Can I prep your heart right now? Your eternity is not based on who's in the White House. And at Redemption Church, we exist to elevate the name of Christ. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to bring you back to him every time we can. When the tension arises and you're arguing on Facebook with all your friends, right, and everything's getting crazy and intense, I just want you to know, you come back here, Christ. Christ. He reigns. He's on the throne. He's over who's ever in the White House. He's sovereignly over it, which means he sovereignly allows to be there who he wants to be there. It doesn't happen outside of his sovereignty. I should move on. <laughs> Others will elevate icons. We're going to put Mary on the pole and we're going to put Peter and John on the pole. Our great theologians like John Calvin on the pole. Others will elevate spiritual disciplines. Others will elevate personal growth. And while so many of these things are actually good, none of them are the main thing. And so if we elevate anything other than Christ, hear me, church, we're wrong. We are wrong. And Christ is going to look at us and say, you search the scriptures because you're looking for eternal life, but it is they that bear witness about me. My kids love Where's Waldo books. Anyone here's kids enjoy those books? Some of you don't even know who Waldo is. We'll have a picture for you to see him, okay? Where's Waldo books, right? And the point of the book is you, every page has like a picture that's just blitzed with all sorts of things. You have to find the main character. You have to find Waldo. It is the title of the book. Where's Waldo? Now, my kids, when you open up a page in, uh, in, 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 his, in this book, often on each page they'll have like 5, 10, 15, 20 other things that you can find in that picture. And the question I always ask them is, where's Waldo? You can get lost in secondary things and miss out on the main thing. The book of Waldo exists for us to find Waldo the Bible exists to find Jesus. Jesus does what Waldo never could. Jesus is required to change your life. And so our gospel takeaway this morning is this, is my only response to the good news is to live for Christ alone. Church, the point of the scriptures is that Jesus is the point. And if we elevate anything but Jesus and Christ alone, it's going to go bad for us. And so what would it look like as a church? What would it look like for you as an individual, right, to, to rally your whole entire life around Christ alone? What would that speak to in your marriage? What would that speak to in your home? What would that speak to in your interaction with your neighbors? Christ alone, everything evolves around him. The scriptures elevate him, so we elevate him. Christ rescues us with the good news. And so whatever the scriptures elevate, we should elevate and so what happened today, if you could leave this morning, organizing your entire life around Christ alone. Well, think about the clarity it would give you. Think about the purpose it would give you in your life. Think about the value it provides in your life, that every aspect of life is actually not about me. It's actually about him. He's not just the Lord of the Bible. He's the Lord of creation. He's the Lord of life. He's over every aspect of everything in our lives. Nothing happens in your life on accident. He is the gatekeeper of all things that happen in your life because he is the Lord. He is Christ and we gather to worship him alone. Let's pray. Jesus, I want to thank you for your word and thank you for your kindness towards us. Lord, from Genesis Revelation, Lord, we believe that you're telling the story of the good news of you. 
And the problem is, Lord, we can't often see the good news if we can't see the bad news of who we are apart from you. And so, Lord, I want each and every person at Redemption Church to put the weight of who they are into you, not on themselves. I also want to confess, Lord, I'm a recovering Pharisee. And I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room. And so, Lord, we have to step into the bad news, into the light to embrace it so we can see the beauty and the wonder of the good news. And so, Lord, I just want to say I'm grateful for Christ alone. In your name, amen.